Uh, hi, my name is Chris. I'm co-founder of vPlay. Uh, for the guys of you who don't know us yet, you probably have used the application developed by us. So the Qt World Summit app uh, was developed by uh, our team and is using heavily the vPlay app components. Um, basically, vPlay is a um, framework or an engine that extends Qt and makes it easier to make mobile applications and games with it. Uh, it's a set of about 100, 150 components uh, that exist that you can use in Qt C++ and Qt QML, um, which help you to make 2D games and mobile applications faster. And um, after the past five years of, of heavy development of, um, in the mobile world with Qt and doing like several uh, mobile applications also with a lot of clients, uh, from us, some are li listed here. I want to share the best practices that we've learned from doing these mobile applications and give you some pointers how you can improve your productivity and efficiency uh, when doing mobile applications with Qt. So I'd like to start with actually doing some cool live coding. Uh, and what I'm going to show you is giving you some tips and showing you how to set up the basis navigation structure of the Qt World Summit application. So I'm now starting... Qt Creator. Yeah, can you see it? Good. And I want to start with a fresh new project. And um, when I click File New Project, you'll already see here some changes compared to a stock Qt Creator, um, which is basically these two fields here that there is a vPlay Games and Apps section where you can choose different type of application templates that we already provide. And uh, for this demo here, I'd like to start a tapped application. Name it tab app, which is just a desktop target. This is also new, so you can choose different plugins that you'd like to integrate uh, to your mobile application. For example, if you want to integrate mobile apps with Google AdMob or Google Analytics, you can just select this here, but I'm skipping this here. And the new project is created. All right, then let's run this. Compiling, and the application looks like this, just two pages where you can switch between them. Um, what you can also see here is that I can change different themes, so I can switch to an iOS or Android theme. This is a tabbed application, so these are um, tabs which look differently on iOS than on Android. On, Andro on iOS it usually is on the bottom, whereas on Android it's on the top. And just quickly, Let's get to the code in, uh, of this. So what you can see here is that uh, the navigation mode is set to the tabs by default. I could also disable this here. And then on Android, we would also have a navigation drawer, which is then the one that you are seeing now in the uh, Qt World Summit application, where the drawer is popping out if you're swiping it from the right, uh, from the left. And again, can switch between platforms. So. Um, first tip um, is when you write application code, um, th this all application here that you can see is all QML code. So this is the first page here, you can jump into it. This is the main navigation structure. So whenever I change anything here, for example, I, I change the, act, the app text here to something one, two, three. Um, and whenever you want to test this change that you just did, what you're usually used to is you just run the application, right? Uh, however, there is a couple of uh, tips and tricks to make this a little bit faster. So what I usually recommend to uh, um, new employees, when, especially when we onboard new developers at vPlay, is first of all, especially if you are in Windows, to disable shadow build here. Uh, what happens now is that the Binary does not get copied to a different directory, um, but the same directory where you're writing the QML files is actually uh, compiled. And um, in Qt Creator, there is on the bottom here, there's this rerun application button, 
which is quite hidden, but it's super useful, because what happens here is that you do not trigger a new recompilation of the program, but you just rerun it. And as the QML files is interpreted at runtime, uh, there's no need to compile it every time that if you just change QML source files. So uh, essentially, this saves you a couple of seconds because no recompilation is required. And especially if you have, for example, image assets um, in your application that would then would be bundled into a Qt resource file. This, these in, uh, image assets all need to be recompiled as well and takes a lot of time. So this is uh, really a nice trick how you can get a little bit out of productivity and improve your workflow a little bit. Of, by default, a regular Qt application, everything is in Qt resource um, files. However, we, we change this default structure. We are using the old the deployment folders uh, solution. So deployment folders means you just copy from um, a source directory, in this case the QML directory, into a application uh, to a target directory, which is in this case um, um, the preferred way to do it with QML files because it's fine to just um, modify a QML file and then not recompile it at all. However, when you want to publish your application then to the app stores, for example, uh, you would then need to add your application QML files into QRC, Qt resource files, because otherwise everybody could just uh, copy your QML files out of an application, uh, Android application, for example. Um, to make this a little bit easier, we just added a default setting for this. So uh, you can enable resources here, and then you can see on the left-hand side I commented the assets folder, now I want to comment the QML files. And then you can see here that the resources QRC file is listed, and all that is then left to do is that you change the entry point from a, not from a local QML file, but to a QRC file. So if I change this here as well, and then save and recompile, it works the same like before but the QML files are now bundled as a QRC file into your application and thus protected. Same application here. Now for quick demoing and testing and during development, however, I switch it back, switch the entry point back, and also switch the resources back. All right, so another thing that is a little bit tricky with these changes from uh, S um, deployment folders and QRC is that uh, usually you want to avoid things like having, for example, an, an image in here and the image source path. So you do not want to write something like this in your code because this, this makes it really then messy. Um, other, instead, you want to use like relative paths define the assets directory, and there is a vplay logo, PNG, which we can then access. Run it. And the same source binding now also works if I switch back to QRC, which is um, like a, a trick that we did here to make sure that you do not need to change your application code actually when you're switching between these deployment folders and QRC uh, structure. The way that we did this internally is by um, writing a custom URL interceptor. I'm not sure if you ever needed this, but it's exactly for this use case, we are dynamically switching the source from the Qt resource file uh, to the deployment folders, which allows to, to always work with relative file paths, which is nice. All right, but we don't need the image now. What I want to show you is the navigation structure, which is actually um, one of the most useful components, I think, from the vplay apps component set. And what it allows you to do is to define a page wrapped within a navigation stack. And within this navigation stack, you can push and pop pages on it. So what I'm doing here is adding a button. which allows me to push another page uh, onto the stack. Just show you how this looks like now at the moment. Um, 
exactly like before, right? Uh, the only thing that changed is if you notice this here that uh, there is this navigation drawer icon now here, now that I've added the navigation stack, because with the navigation stack, you usually have a navigation bar on top and can set a title for it. So to set the title here, just use the title property. Rerun. Then you can see the title here. If I switch to iOS, it looks the same like a native iOS look and feel. So what to do with this button? Um, what I'd like to show you is how to push and pop different pages to this navigation stack. So to actually simulate this navigation behavior, um, what we do here is have a push page button, which shall, when clicked, push to the navigation stack, and the navigation stack is a property of the page. Push another page, and just for demoing, I'm pushing the same page here. So the first page, that came up. So, let's see what happens. So we now got this push page button here, and voila, whenever we push a page, gets added and pushed and popped to the navigation stack. The really cool thing now is that um, this navigation is really a native um, look and feel navigation like you're used to on, on iOS. If you now change this to Android, you got this native looking Android uh, navigation look and feel where the pages are transitioning from the bottom and popping in on the reverse direction. You also get this material style effects here when you push. Desktop is like a fallback, fall it's like a mixture of iOS and Android. Um, exactly. And I, you can still switch between the different pages, so on the second page there is no navigation stack yet, so that's why there is no title list there. All right. So what you can also do is whenever you push a new page, it could, for example, um, modify the, the properties of this, of this page. For example, I can set the title property to this page title and, for example, add an X to it, just a string append, rerun this. And now every time that I push something, the title changes its name to something very nice. <laughs> All right. Another tip I want to show you is regarding density independent uh, sizes. So f for this use case, we, we do have own com component and, and we play apps, which is called DP and SP, which is actually taken the name from uh, how also in Android they are called. And you can use this for, uh, to define, for example, sizes of a text. You can example, say, okay, I want to make this 15 density independent pixels. And the crucial thing here is that this is really the same physical size across all the devices that are out there. So no matter if it's an iOS, which iOS device, if it's a tablet, no matter which DPI this device has, uh, same as on Android, the same physical size across all platforms and all devices is guaranteed with this, um, with this structure. Benefit of using SP in comparison to the regular density independence that this SP setting also takes into account the user's system setting for font sizes. So there are people who, who have like huge font sizes because they have like visibility issues. Um, then this is also reflected here when you're using the SP uh, function. For everything else, for example, for defining spacings, the DP can be used, and this is the density independent pixels just as, as you used it on Android. So there's a lot of design guidelines that you should follow. For example, a button should have like a minimum of 18 dp um, and things like this. You can read up on this on the um, Google material and design blog, for example. Alrighty. So what I also would like to show you is how to optimize your app then for um, tablets as well. So. Um, for this use case, we do provide a 
default split view parameter that you can use, which is available in the navigation item. And uh, for this demo now, we, we set the split view. Is it navigation stack? Yeah, it's navigation stack. Uh, we, we set this only to true if, if the device is a tablet. So let's see what happens. So this is like normal phone behavior, right? Nothing fancy. But when you now uh, make the screen size bigger, you'll see that on the left-hand side there's now a master detail navigation which is common in tablets. So you can make best use of the available screen space. So what you can see now is that this is displayed whenever the screen size is big enough. You can also customize this when you want to have the split, split view available. Um, and the co pretty cool thing is that you can also different, uh, simulate different device um, look and feels from this resolution menu here on top. And as you can see, this is really like a one-to-one -one representation, like if you have a mobile device um, simulated on the desktop. So this again is really like a productivity boost. You don't need to deploy every time to your mobile device, but you can do a very much, do a very lot already on the desktop, which is a, a lot shorter um, testing cycle, of course. Um, you can also switch to, to tablet then from here, of course. And to see how this is looking like on Android. Very similar. You're getting that one here as well. So the navigation stack is um, pretty powerful. So you can also, for example, pop all of the pages that are currently there and return to the first one. Um, you can do this like this. If you add another app button, name it pop all. Calling that one. Then no matter how deep you are in the um, navigation stack, a pop all also always will uh, bring you back to the first page. Uh, if you have realized this in the World Summit app, for example, you, the, the stack can get quite deep. For example, if you're going from the business meeting feature, you're selecting a user, then you're entering one, one page to the stack. Then from the user, you can write a chat message, from the chat message, you can go back to the profile page again, and it's getting bigger and bigger. And whenever I press on the, on the main navigation somewhere here, um, I, I, I would like to have all the pages where I've currently been popped, though. So this is like a, sh a shortcut to the main, the main functionality. All right. So. So, so far we have seen how to use the navigation and navigation stack components to build like an app structure like you've seen in the World Summit app, how you can simulate platforms and resolutions, and um, how to use SP for font sizes that scale independently of your screen density, and DP for the rest, uh, remaining item sizes. Um, also how you can do responsive layouts using the split view, uh, property and a master detail view that is then automatically used, and the Qt Creator deployment folders tip, um, which accelerates the uh, deployment time. For a more in depth examples, uh, you can also have a look at the uh, sample launcher that's also coming with the SDK, which is also quite neat because what that one allows you to do is to browse all the examples that we did, so for example also the World Summit app um, is, is open source and available in the SDK and you can browse all of these and have, have a look at them and directly jump into the source code. Um, so these are the app examples that we provide, some like list examples how you can do uh, list with swiping features and there's also the games that you can make use of, for example this card games that we did can launch this directly from the sample launcher and 
directly. Yeah. Great. <laughs> and directly play, um, multiplayer or single player. And cool thing is, like I said, you can just click on the source code button here, and that one will direct uh, directly open this project file in Qt Create and you jump directly into the source code. Configure project and we've got all the source files here. You might have noticed that the screen uh, also looks a little bit different than the stock Qt Creator. That's why um, we added our own Qt Creator plugin. Um, which adds this page, which makes, there's some tutorials in it that uh, simplify app and theme de development first steps. And you can also start sample launcher then from here or from this tab. All right. So now let's get to the actual, to the biggest development boost uh, in terms of productivity that I've seen in the last half year. So who of you guys there's no QML live. Cool, that's a couple. How many of you are actually using it in production? Also a few. Awesome. So I'll show you what, what you can do with QML live and why this is so cool. All right. So this is a live demo of this now. There can be a lot of stuff going on. So. Um, what you see in the Qt Creator plugin as well, besides this new welcome page, um, an own one that we did, is this live button here. And for this demonstration, I'm switching to another project, which is a bit more fancy. So I switched the project now here, and I'm now pressing this live run button here. And what you can see here is that the live QML live client is started, and that you can also select the QML files that you want to start with initially here. So for this demo, I'm start just starting with the main QML. And as you can see here, the, the right uh, client here on the right automatically loaded the QML file. This is nothing fancy. This is just like QML scene um, is working. And um, the really cool thing now is that you can change this, um, your code. And for example, I'm, I'm changing this interface styling header here and remove the exclamation marks. Now I'm pressing save. And you can see that the QML application was directly instantly reloaded without me having to rerun and recompile this. So this is, this is getting instantly. Um, and um, no rebuilding, no recompiling required. And this alone really like, saves hours and hours of development. So think about how often, how many times you as a developer per day press a recompile or rerun button. It's probably like 100 times a day, 200 times a day. If you save with this just like 10 seconds or even a minute, that, that's, like, that's a lot. Um, and it really, for recompilation, it really depends on how many things you change and how many assets you have. Because like I said, the assets that um, are bundled into the Qt um, binary, these need to be recompiled as well. With this, if you just change QML source code, this is just reloaded uh, and um, directly visible. So the next thing, the next step, is to not only update the QML content on one, client device here, but to also connect other devices, uh, especially mobile devices, because mobile deployment is even taking longer, because for example, for Android or iOS, you really need to redo the whole packaging, recompile a new APK file for Android every time that you redeploy it to your phone. Wouldn't it be cool to just change a QML file, change the content, and see this instantly available? Yeah, that's exactly what you can do with QML Live. So as you can see here, I've set up two more devices, Android emulator and my iPhone here. And um, the, the way that I'm running these now is I've, I've um, run the Android emulator and started it before. 
now running the vplay live client here. And what I can do now is connect it and redeploy. And all right. That's the thing with live demos. Let's start the Android emulator again. Meanwhile, I also connect my iPhone here. Um, lonely Screen is just an application where you can stream the content of your phone to the um, Windows PC. working via AirPlay. All right. So as this emulator is running on a local host, I need to do some port forwarding. Starting a client. Yeah, now it's working. And you can see here that the QML file now is transferred to the Android emulator. And the same way it will also work on your Android device, actually. Um, and whenever I do any changes here, for example, changing the theming color, making it a very nice orange, and save. Oh, blue. Let's make it orange. You can see. Uh, QML file is updated on your remote device, even on an Android phone. So I'm, I'm sorry this AirPlay is not connecting here. I cannot stream the content from my iPhone here. Anyways, I can show you then later uh, if, you, if you can buy after the talk. So why is this so, so uh, uh, such a time, time saver? Because like I said, deployment on mobile devices takes ages usually. It's between one and three minutes, depending on how, how big the assets are that you're transferring. With this approach, it's really like a matter of seconds. And although you can do most of the testing on desktop, in some cases, in some kind of applications, they do need a mobile testing environment. For example, like real native dialogues, like for example, um, uh, Android native dialogue here, or uh, Android Sheets, input dialogues, or for example, to flip the status bar or open the gallery and things like this. Uh, these are really like native calls that cannot be emulated on the desktop. Or whenever you do like applications with sensors or map applications, it's usually best to test them on a real device. And um, this really helps you to um, massively decrease the time that you need for redeploying on mobile devices. And the really cool thing is, that um, redeployment works for, for actually all the devices simultaneously. So you don't need, need to first, okay, first I build it for Android, then I build it for uh, iOS, then for desktop, but all the different builds are transferred via Wi-Fi at the same time. And best of all, even from a Windows machine, I can now deploy to an iPhone, uh, which was not possible before, or even from a Linux. Actually, you can deploy from any supported desktop Qt platform, so basically from Windows, Mac, and Linux, to any supported Qt platform out there. So you can even deploy to, um, um, to embedded devices, for example. Actually, this whole QML Live framework was started by Pelagicor and is m used mostly in the uh, automotive environment because they're, for embedded devices, um, the, 
deployment to embedded devices is also particularly taking long and is troublesome. Um, so um, our step in this whole process was to really optimize this for mobile. What you can expect in the next two weeks is that you can will see in the mobile app stores a QML Live application available, which allows you to exactly like I show you, just click the QML Live server button in Qt Creator, modify your QML code, uh, and then have your content updated instantly on all the mobile devices that are on the same Wi-Fi, all at the same time. So you see the same resu same um, results instantly on iOS, Android, or whatever other tablets and or smartphones that you have connected. Um, and so even more if you consider the time savings that this brings, so maybe you deploy it like 10 or 20 times a day to an Android device, that's like 20 minutes uh, at least. With this, it's less than a minute that it takes you. So it's really hours and hours a month that you can save with this, with this boost. In addition, it also helps to um, reduce the pain of mobile plugins. Uh, with plugins, I'm meaning third-party SDKs and services, which are usually quite tricky to set up, especially if you have multiple of them. For example, you could add um, analytics services, you could add push notifications, you could add Google AdMob as mobile ad provider, and all of these add dependencies and requires sev several changes for the Android and iOS deployment tool steps. With this approach, uh, you don't need to care about the main integration initially any longer because um, we took care of this in the mobile application. So the mobile app ships already with all the plugins that we provide for analytics, ads, push notifications, and you can just use it in QML and really get, um, get to the core of your product, which is actually the, the logic and don't need to spend time with building and deployment. Um, even more, you don't even necessarily need initially to have an Android SDK or NDK or anything installed. All that you need is actually a text editor would be enough, uh, plus um, the QML live client installed on your mobile phone. Because the QML live server doesn't really care if you're adding it from um, Qt Creator or from just a, a regular text editor. So you don't even, for quick setup, you don't even need a, um, an IDE for this. And most importantly, there is no issues with different SDK, NDK, Qt Creator versions. Uh, who has done like serious Android deployment um, probably knows that there is, with every new Qt release, there is, again, a couple of issues. These are like out of the way with this approach. So like I said, in the next weeks, there is a QML Live app coming from the App Store, so which you can download for free and also um, embedded in Qt Creator. And we will publish uh, all the source modifications that we did for the QML Live client and server, so you can also use that in your own company environment. Um, we will announce it on vplanet. So another thing to note is uh, here that this works not only with the vplay components, which are basically just on top of, of Qt Quick and QML, but it's also working with the regular uh, QML components. So you can also use it with Qt Quick Controls 2, uh, Qt Controls 1, um, as, as you see fit in your project. And uh, of course, what is not working is if you, if you change C++ code, because this reads re recompilation, um, but you can still build the mobile client yourself if you have custom C++ code. So you can just use the QML live reloading in your own, uh, in your own applications. Just a quick question to the audience. Um, who of you guys is actually using C++ and QML mixed in the projects that you're developing? All right, quite too many. Um, anybody not using QML at all? So only C++? All right. Anybody only using QML? Yay. <laughs> you, will, you will love this feature. And that the, more you, the more you use QML, that the better it is actually. And um, one of the um, productivity tips I'd like to share is that, in my opinion, using QML as much as possible actually speeds up the development time. Of course, it has to do with what your experience level in the team is, if how experienced you are with C++, uh, how many C++ plus de developers you have in the team. But generally speaking, it's way um, less lines of codes that you need in QML. It's easier to learn, easier to onboard new uh, developers and join the team, and also easier to understand and read. And um, 
And especially it allows QML live code really room. Um, of course, if there are high performance requirements or if the, you already have Ledger C code, there's no need to port this back to QML. But if you start new functionality and a new project, I would highly recommend starting with QML only at first. And then if you see the, if there is performance issues, you can still bring these parts to C++ then. Actually, all the applications that you have seen in, um, in the sample launcher that I've shown you before and also the World Summit app is 100% QML code. So not only the UI, but also the application logic is everything in QML. Um, and this op opens up like a, a lot of different um, benefits like the improved deployment times that I just mentioned. So what's next for QML Live um, on, on our roadmap? So in the next two weeks, approximately the uh, iOS and Android QML Live apps will be released together with Qt Creator plugin. And then in addition to that, um, um, you will be possible to not only deploy to your mobile devices from the same network, because that's some, sometimes limited. For example, if, if you want to give the application to your testers, how should they get it if, if they're not in the same Wi-Fi? There's no way. So this is why we will, um, we will add a, a web dashboard where you can upload your QML files to. And from this web server, it is then streamed to, um, to the, um, mobile client or to, to whatever client that, that you see fit. So this really simplifies test distribution of QML projects uh, and also beta uh, distribution because in addition to this dashboard where you can see which uh, project was transferred to which devices, you can also see a log output of the different devices. I didn't show this before in the QML server, but the QML server has the option to show all the log uh, logging outputs that happened um, before the crash, but also before that. So you can really forward all of the log outputs from your mobile devices to this dashboard then, and which helps you to find issues um, on mobile by browsing through the stack trace and the log output. Uh, as a next step, then you will also be possible to fully build QML um, applications from a cloud server. Um, which also supports uploading of custom C++ code. So this is the next step then, because essentially you wouldn't even need to, to have a local um, deployment uh, set up because the QML project is built in the cloud for you. Um, there, there's also be the option to upload custom C++ code and to run this on-premise on, on your own servers, but there's more to that coming in coming month. And Essentially, this really s solves the pain of different uh, third-party service dependencies, um, NDK, SDK issues, and issues with different Qt versions and different Qt creator versions, which, which is always a bit weird in the mobile world. Um, so essentially, this helps to remove the barriers of Qt and QML for mobile, which is, I think, a really good thing. All right. So to the second section, which is a um, couple of tips for uh, Backend development. So initially, this, uh, there's always a question: develop an own backend or use an existing one. And some scenarios, like in company environments where already a backend exists, the question is not really there because you're restrained or restricted to the existing backend that you have. But if you're doing a new project or a new app, um, definitely think about: does it really pay off if you do the whole backend on your own, or if you uh, use existing services that uh, help you with that. So, of course, you can define, if you're doing your own one, you can define the whole API based around your requirements and APIs. So it's the biggest flexibility that you have. Uh, you don't have any dependencies to whatever third-party services, and you have com com complete control over the backend. Um, on the downside, though, you need specialists or uh, developers who know how to do um, to develop and in backend code, PHP, Java, Node.js, Ruby, Go, whatever, whatever your expertise is. Um, and the complexity grows, of course, because also you need to care about scaling issues that might happen. Um, and in most companies, um, the, this is not the main experience uh, and expert field of expertise. So in, in, this, in this scenario, I think it's better to uh, try other existing backends that already exist. How to access backend code? This is uh, just a 
small code snippet how you can use XML HTTP requests. I guess you all are familiar with this, how to do this with QML. There's also other ways like using web sockets or if um, if you're doing this from QML, I would highly recommend to check out this Drupal agent uh, GitHub repository. It really makes things um, with, XML, with HTTP requests and REST APIs a lot easier. So the alternative to a custom backend is of course a managed one or an existing. Um, advantages of it compared to a custom one is um, that scaling is already taken care of. For example, if you're taking Google Firebase, uh, you have the Google power behind it, so it usually scales well no matter how many users that you got. It also allows you to get to market quicker, so you can do an MVP faster, uh, and it's usually a lot cheaper to set up, of course. Uh, also, if when you're accessing a, a, a custom backend, what really takes usually a lot of time is how to do this caching and conflict scenarios um, of if your remote data is not the same like your local one. So this get, can get really tricky, for example, if your device is offline for a while and you're accessing the same data from two different sets, but and the data is in conflict, how do you resolve that? So that's, uh, that's some tricky things. Um, and existing services already provide merge and um, conflict scenarios for, the, for these. Downside, of course, is um, you sometimes need to work around the backend that exists. Uh, so to, to comply with its, um, its way of doing things. And you add one additional dependency, of course, for example, for Google or uh, Amazon in the case of, of our game network. So for an example, how you could, for example, do a user authorization with email um, with Google Firebase. So you can see this here in the source code. Uh, with the register user call. So that's an email authentication which also supports password reset and uh, authentication on the Google servers. Um, and second example here is how you can, for example, increase an app start counter across multiple devices. Um, so this is how it works with the Firebase plugins that we provide for QML. You call a get user value and then you can listen to the unread completed um, signal where you then can read the value and write it back. As an alternative to Firebase, I'd also like to show you what uh, Vplay Game Network, or actually the Vplay backend is doing, because it's a lot, it's grown to a lot more than just the game network. Um, the the Vplay backend actually is written on the client um, fully with Qt and uh, partly also with QML. So this means it's supported across all the platforms where Qt also runs on including desktop and also embedded devices. On the other hand, Firebase only is working on iOS and Android. Um, the the Vplay um, backend and Vplay client components especially also have a default user interfaces for the most important, um, for the most important um, UIs for like, for example, um, a user profile. And this is exactly what you can see in the Qt World Summit app if you have been in the social section. You can um, add your custom fields, and in this case, we set the custom fields, for example, to um, job experience level, the company name, and um, the way we built this um, was based on uh, our own backend, where we just add custom data to the user field, but we could reuse all of the remaining things of the backend. So we could reuse the chat system that's in place, which is working with push notifications. If you receive a uh, message, you get a push notification automatically. We could reuse the, the profile system where you can change your profile picture and upload this to the server, for example. Um, and, and a lot of more things. And um, you can really use these components out of the box, customize them, and uh, allows you to get to market a lot faster. Um, downside is that the, from Vplay compared to Firebase, that Firebase is really like a real-time um, database that you can use. Um, Vplay is semi-real-time, so every time that you write something and there is a conflict in there, then it gets resolved, or you can um, 
you, you can res also resolve it uh, manually with push notifications, but other than that, it's more a pull approach and not, auto it's not automatically pushed in, in real time. Uh, and also, Weebler backend compares, it's a little bit less um, filterable and less um, um, flexible in terms of data access rights. So, for example, if you want to uh, restrict the access that certain values of a user are not visible for others, um, you can do so, but not on the system, system level. This is what Firebase is really doing quite well. Uh, on the other hand, what the Weeble backend does provide is anonymous lo login and late login. I'm not sure who of you guys have seen my, my first talk today. Uh, this is about, this was mainly about retention, how to increase the retention of your app and game. And especially like a late login is really essential to increase the retention rate of your applications. Um, what I mean with this is you should by all means avoid to have a login screen in the initial uh, page of your application because the users did not really see the value of the application and the product yet. Uh, so skip, ideally skip the login part to as late as possible. And only when the user have experienced the value and see the value that they shall give their um, user credentials to you, only then uh, ask for a login and only then if it's required. Um, the way that, that we do is, uh, this is um, we create a default user by default whenever you start the application the first time. And um, you can then later on connect your account with like a, a super account uh, with Facebook or um, via email. And with this, we can then synchronize and connect multiple devices on different platform and different devices to the same user. But this only happens when the user really opts to connect his account with Facebook, for example, because he wants to um, store something on, uh, on, the, on the iPhone and then he's getting home and has an Android tablet and he wants the same data synced. Um, for this, he needs the same account on, on both devices. But just for regular usage, and if you don't have a second device where you want to share the data with, there's no need to create an own um, user login for this. Firebase requires it. So you can see an example on the right, how to um, access, for example, web storage is just a simple key value. Um, key value store, and how to open the, the chat view that you are, have seen in the World Summit application. So there's, like I said, there's default views for uh, all of the uh, views that you're seeing in the World Summit app, um, and you can then customize this to your uh, application theme to make it even look better and uh, look embedded into your application. The cool thing is you can also mix these two. So if, if you see, okay, we would need more access rights um, for some things. For example, at the moment we're doing a project uh, where users can share and upload project, uh, products and other users can access these products and then buy these products. Uh, this is a perfect use case where um, this is really good uh, to do in, in Firebase because in Firebase you can also do like location-based sorting and for example filter by distance or show me only the users who are like within 10 kilometers of range. Um, and on the other hand, the Vplay backend is really good in doing um, user systems, user messaging, chat systems, um, the, the profile system, and you can connect these two together. So let the one part do what it's best at and the other thing as well. All right, so then I have two small tips left. Uh, number one is for um, things always can get wrong and the problem, um, if you submit your application to the App Store is that it usually takes one to three days even for updates until they get approved by Apple. And uh, Apple is not the quality testing, so they, they do check the most important things, but there can always be things that you do not think of and then you have this application out and uh, this might cause frustration to your users, bad reviews, which you doesn't, don't want. So um, usually what we suggest, having this in all applications that release to the app stores, is having, again, a remote uh, loader. This one is a lot more limited, of course, but what, what it basically does, it loads a remote QML file, and in this QML file you can change anything that you want at runtime, um, add any checks that you want, for example, if you want to show to users that the new update um, is available, 
Uh, you can send push notifications, but the majority of users do not turn on push notifications, so you won't reach them. A majority of users also do not have the auto update um, enabled for iOS and Android. Um, so they have, they actually don't know there is a new version of, of your app available. And you can solve this issue by just adding this um, QML code on the right here, which is basically displaying um, a native dialog if the application on the server that you detect is bigger than the one on, uh, installed on the client. Uh, and of course, you're not just limited to just doing these things. You can even do A-B testing, for example, change the property values in your, um, uh, in your application from QML code. And it really helps to um, yeah, get updates out quicker and do like quick fixes uh, in a rapid way. And then as a last tip, um, and any app that you release to the app stores, add some kind of analytics to it because otherwise you're just blind. You don't really know what the users are doing in your application. You don't really know where do they stop and you don't really know how to improve your app. And um, we're a big fan of Amplitude. Uh, Amplitude is an amp analytics service that's really like skyrocketed in the past two years. Uh, it's, it's really the best, best analytics tools that we've been using so far and we've tried all of all of these here, also Google Analytics and Flurry. But um, so if, if you're doing any analytics, give M Amplitude a, um, a thought. Um, we have a plugin for that, so it's really like, I'll show you in a minute, how to integrate this into your Qt projects. And um, really the, the best things at Amplitude is that they really help you to understand um, how the, the product is used by, by your users. So oftentimes in Google Analytics, it's very hard to find the, the reasoning behind uh, what the data is showing you. In Amplitude, you re can really jump in and, and have a look at, for example, all the users who drop off between two steps and have a look at, okay, what are these guys doing then instead? Uh, and this really helps you to better understand your application and users. This is how to implement this. Um, for iOS, the profile needs to be modified. Uh, you can just copy the frameworks folder from the GitHub repository linked here uh, and uh, add the vplay plugins um, line to your profile. On Android, simply modify the build Cradle file and then the latest plugin is fetched from our servers. And we make sure to the, the version of the plugin matches the Qt version that you are currently have. And then the implementation is really just a couple of lines um, at the input vplay uh, plugins import, then you can use it just like a regular QML item. Um, with the difference that this amplitude item is internally a third party SDK that you access. So internally, we are using JNI on, on Android to access the native functionality and on iOS, the Objective C sources. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, so that was um, an overview of like. The, the best tips that we have so far uh, in mobile app development with Qt. So if you have any new projects or existing ones and you need some help on mobile, don't hesitate to contact us. Um, just head over to vplay.net slash contact. Talk to me here after the call, uh, after the talk. Um, we are there to support you on mobile. And um, I hope that you guys will love the QML Live uh, applications that will come out to help us all make better apps based with Qt. Thanks.